it was nowhere near a price point of something that I could afford, nor did I even own a wall to put it on. Like this was just not something that was in my realm. But I remember saying to myself, I want to be able to buy this piece in the future. I want to be able to have a home and I want to be able to buy things that move me. Hi, I'm George, the co-founder of Blue Thumb, and I'm joined by my colleague, Amy. Welcome to season two of the Art in My Home podcast. We uncover the surprising stories from the art collections of unexpected guests. Today's guest is Rachel Newman. Rachel is the co-founder and partner at Flying Fox Ventures. It's an early stage investment firm supporting ambitious Australian and New Zealand founders with nearly 200 investments in their investment portfolio. Rachel's been a key figure in the startup world and previously has served as the head of startups at ANZ for Amazon Web Services and the managing director here for Eventbrite Australia. But beyond her career in startups, Rachel's passion for modern art has been a driving force in her life. She serves on the Council of Trustees at the NGV, the National Gallery of Victoria, and she recently presented at the NGV's annual lecture, Artificial, the Use of AI in Art, which I can't wait to talk about. Rachel is also building a gallery style home in the Victorian countryside for her ever growing art collection. And again, I'm looking forward to hearing all about that. So thank you very much for coming on, Rachel. Welcome. Thanks for having me, George and Amy. All right, Rachel. So we'll get started on the art questions first. Can you tell us about your journey into art collecting? What kind of sparked your initial interest in it? I mean, I, I wish that I had a more elaborate story, but really it was just about me always loving art and feeling really moved by it. And then just wanting these beautiful things in my life. I just knew that I <laughs> felt different when I was surrounded by art and in my work, which is very technical. And I spent a lot of time diving deep into t technology or into business. I feel like if I can look up and look around and see nature and see art, that's what is restorative for me, both as an introvert and as a nature and an art lover. Mm -hmm. And so for me, collecting was just, how do I surround myself with the feelings that I get? when I see beautiful art. So it wasn't a deliberate journey. I'm an investor, but this wasn't an investment asset for me. This was just how do I bring beauty into my life and how do I feel inspired by other people's genius? There is a moment for me, and this isn't about art specifically, but I remember many years ago, I was house hunting actually in the Bay Area and I walked into this architecturally beautiful house. It was a mid-century modern and it kind of took my breath away, not because the house was so gorgeous, although it was, but it was really clear that I was standing inside the zone of this architect's genius. I was like, everything that he had went into this moment. There's art that I look at and I can feel that I'm in the presence of someone's genius and everyone has a genius, but it's different for everyone. But when I feel compelled by art, it's when I see their genius on display. And aside from being surrounded by beautiful things, being surrounded by people's moments of genius is what kind of fortifies me as I do my work and my life and some of the both mundane and the complex things that I tackle. I love that. Mm. That's a great thought on it. <laughs> do, do you remember the first piece of art you bought, Rachel? Well, I, I remember the first kind of substantial piece that was kind of expensive and a little bit like, ooh, you know, this is pricey. Um, and it actually, it was in San Francisco. My partner and I were at a friend's 40th birthday party that happened to be inside of a gallery. And so, you know, we were just having drinks and wine and cheese. And it was this huge, beautiful piece. And we like really bold things. Like we're not afraid of color, the more neon and kind of bright colors. And this has this like big <laughs> teal bus with a bird driving it. And it's kind of street arty and it's very vibrant. And we were just standing there and I looked up and both of us were just like so moved by the piece. And we saw the price tag and we're like, Ooh, are we going to, we're not going to spend that on art. <laughs> and then I was like, why not? And so it felt like our, our first big grown up purchase because it was like big in size. And so that's saying like, I'm going to hang art, right? I'm going to like punch people in the face and let them know, like, I love art and I'm going to put my money behind this great piece. And so I remember that. I, it's probably not the first piece that we bought, but it was the line in the sand. Like we are going to buy art, God damn it. And we're going to display it in our homes mm. in a really big and bold way. <laughs> a piece that punches you in the face. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that says a lot about your collection as well, Rachel, because the examples you sent through for us, like 
the Brad gun in particular, it's a bit different. It's very in your face and mm. it's very, and we meant to ask you why he's affectionately, or they are affectionately called Bertina. Um, but it is very just you're unashamed about, like it doesn't need to suit a house. It just is like what you want. Yeah. You know, if you were to walk through our home, we have lots of mm. big, bold art. I would be offended mm. if everyone loved all of our pieces. That would feel very boring to be. So it's yes. kind of, um, I love every piece, but hopefully yeah. no one else does. Um, and even yeah. the <laughs> Julia Gutman piece that I shared with you guys, it's a self-portrait mm. and I absolutely love it. But I have to be honest, like there's something a bit grotesque to it. And so even that piece, people will walk there by. And they'll feel, I mean, everyone can appreciate the craftsmanship. Like it's unbelievably made and the story about how she uses fabric that is given to her from the people in her world and then how she saw herself in this portrait. Like it's a very powerful piece, but I can't say that it's beautiful. And so I like having some of these pieces where people walk by and they're like, ugh, that's ugly. And others will walk by and say, this is exquisite. And so it's kind of like startups, you know, like I'm in the outlier mm -hmm. business. But if you want, I'll tell you about the Brad Gunn piece. And that I bought through um, Blue Thumb at the Affordable Art Fair. Two, is it two years ago? Correct, um, yeah. And Brad, he's an incredible artist. I actually have since bought two more of his pieces, violating my two-piece per artist rule. So Brad is one of the few artists that I've made exceptions for because his pieces are so great. But I walked past that. And that was kind of the crown jewel of your display that year. And to give people an idea of what it looks like, it's this big purple figure. It's flocked in velvet and it has these luxurious tendrils of hair. And it's in this, you know, supine position. Reclining. Um, and first of all, <laughs> I was compelled to like, yeah, like everyone wanted to touch it. There's a big sign like do not touch, but everyone kind of hovered over it. They like really wanted to touch it. <laughs> but I bought it because it reminded me of my wife, Jody. So... Jody has this like mm. big voluminous hair and she's quite famous. She gets her hair blown out and she has this like big curly lioness mane. And this piece is purple. And it just reminded me of my incredible wife, this big purple voluminous hair lion. And so I bought it like on the spot. I just said, I'm taking this. And I think it was like $1 shy of the price limit of the affordable art fair is like a, a cheeky <laughs> affordable art fair purchase. Um, yeah. And the first, thing I, the, the first thing I did when I bought it, I was still standing next to it. And again, everyone was coming up and they're like, I want to touch it. And I said, you can touch it. They said, no, you can't. I was like, it's mine now. Touch it. So the first thing I did was let everyone touch it. Um, so then we, we brought it home and I knew I was going to have kind of a table size for it. And it was going to sit in this position. But until we had that, we have this big concrete kitchen bench and it's like many meters long. And so the sculpture just sat on the end of the bench was kind of baller. Um, although like my kids bolognese was always a mortal threat to it. Anyway, I wrote to Brad and I just said, Hey, I'm the person who bought this incredible piece. She reminds me of my wife and her big voluminous hair. I love her so much and don't worry. She'll have a place of prominence in my home to which Brad promptly replied. She was actually inspired by the 1971 Cosmo centerfold of Burt Reynolds naked and is a, a symbol of male sexuality to which i said um well they are right at home in our lesbian household so we have like we have laughed so much about this piece it shows that art is in the eye of the beholder and so we lovingly refer to her as bertina because she is burt reynolds and i would love it if you were to pull this image and share it alongside but this image of burt reynolds 1971, That's he is so naked good. with his chest hair and he's laying on animal skin and is in full display. And um, yeah, now effigy to that is right there in my living room. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that he's shockingly hairy. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. When you bought it, did Jody see herself in it or did you say, look, it looks like you? What was her reaction? Yeah, it was like, I bought it. And it's because it, it's a fight. And she's like, yeah, I can see that. So she didn't walk up to and say, this looks like me. I want to own it. But when she yeah. saw that I was moved by it and it was because of her, she was touched. No, it's an amazing piece of art. And yeah, I, I can definitely see the long flowing hair um, oh, from the, absolutely. Of the purple there. Mm. I, I love what you said about 
how some of your art, you know, you love it all and you hope some people don't. You, you know, you like art that has an impact. And it's funny, one of your other pieces that I wanted to talk about was The Weaving by Tammy Cannett. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw her work at Melbourne Contemporary last year. We went, we blew thumb This year. Was it this year? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we went and I love weaving up and my partner hates it. So yeah, I'd love, I'd love to hear about uh, this piece. Yeah, so it, it's important for us that we have a variety of colours and textures and modalities of art too, because I think in the beginning we were just collecting paintings and it can get very flat, right? And so we wanted to bring warmth and accessibility through different textures. We wanted something that was a little bit more 3D and tactile. And so when we were walking through the Melbourne Art Fair and we saw those pieces, like right away, we're just like, yes, these are beautiful. So Jody saw it first and she pulled me across and was like this. And then there were two funny things that happened. So like right away, I was like, yes, we're buying this. Then we asked the gallerist, Sally, who used to tell us about the artist. She told us it was Tammy. And then we realized that we knew her. And we knew her because we had met her on Lake Eildon, where we go on houseboats during the Christmas time. And then we were asking about the piece and they said, oh, this actually was inspired by the landscape of Lake Eildon. And so all of a sudden it had so much meaning to us because Jody spent her whole life growing up summering on houseboats in Lake Eildon. We then knew this woman, unbeknownst to us at the time, and this piece was inspired by a landscape, which is Jody's childhood and now something that we share as a family, which is this like really cute continuity for her. What's funny is that we also were drawn to those colors because we have a beautiful Aboriginal painting in our bedroom that pull from those same colors. They have the greens and the pinks and the purples. And so that piece hangs over our bed. And for me, it's like a conversation between two female artists each painting the landscapes that are important to them, that are both Australian, but very different women from very different backgrounds. What's funny is that once we hung it over the bed, I had a moment where I was like, is this a vagina? Like, does this look like a vagina hanging over <laughs> the bed of two women? And I was like, oh God, did, did I just do this? <laughs> and so a few yeah. days later, I was actually at an NGV trustees meeting and Donna McComb, who's one of the associate director of um, curation there, I had told her that I'd been to the art fair, that we bought a bunch of pieces. And then I said, can I just show you this one? And can you tell me if it's a vagina? And she looked at it and she said, no, this is a landscape. And I was like, okay, if <laughs> a pictorial genius looks at it and says it's a landscape, it's a landscape, goddammit. So I'm sticking with it. It's a landscape. It's yeah. not a vagina, but it brings like a beautiful warmth uh, and depth to our bedroom. And like I said, it's for me, like no one else might know that, but I see these two pieces talking to each other as like two women talking about a land that they share. That's really lovely, that connection to like both mm. of them together. That's so nice. But yeah, I was thinking vagina, but all good. At least that you know? was confirmed. <laughs> We're going to... curator says so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, no? Someone in the team said orifice. Yeah, I'm like, I love these. They look amazing. Someone said no. Because I think there's one that had dark. I was like, no, it's an orifice. Yeah. No, it's not. It's amazing. Anyway. So, yeah, I love yeah. it. I think, yeah, it's my pick from the fair. Uh, <laughs> um, Rachel, has any artworks made it over to Bali with you or are you just going... Cold no, I'm turkey just, and yeah. embracing Bali art instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just here for a few months. I didn't bring any art as my security blankies. Um, but I did just have <laughs> this major piece installed in our house, which is one of the pieces I showed you guys, which is the Yang Yong Liang piece. It's a three meter light box and it took months to fabricate. It took a crew of four people many hours to get up on the wall. It is unbelievably glorious. Like it is a spectacular piece. And I'll be honest, when we planned all of that, because it takes months to do, I didn't even know I was taking this trip. And I did feel like it got hung on the wall. And then I think five days later we were leaving. I haven't had enough time with it. So um, for sure. if only for that reason, I will return home just to spend more time mm. with that piece of art. <laughs> As you should though. I've seen one of his works in the NGV a couple of years ago and was absolutely hypnotized by like 
just the time lapse and the comment on like just the growth of a country. And I was showing George earlier, I was like, George, this is unbelievable. Like just the small minute changes as the city grows and then like, yeah, just incredible work. But yeah, I wanted to ask, how long is the loop for his work? Is it is it like um, 20 minutes or so? That, or? One, that one isn't the animation. So that is a static image. Oh, okay. In oh, okay, sure. Um, sure, what's, sure. What's amazing is I can use an app to change the lighting and even just changing oh, cool. the lumens of the light completely change the mood of the piece. But this piece is made up of hundreds of thousands of individual images that he took of real buildings and then basically self-organizing them into color. So they're not color corrected. Those are the real colors to create these mountains. And for those who don't know his work, he was trained in traditional Chinese landscape painting. So, you know, those beautiful, like cliffy, craggy landscapes. And so this piece is of New York City. And he's recreated the mountainous landscape using these hundreds of thousands of images of buildings. And so what it is, is the natural environment reimagined as the built environment. And I had an opportunity to meet him when he was out here and have lunch and you know talk about his piece. I look at it and it feels a little dystopian. It feels like the concrete, the steel has taken over and we no longer have landscape. He actually saw it a little bit more optimistically and like for him it wasn't a cautionary tale and so but I, again however you interpret it like I as a New Yorker I see this is home um, and so immediately it evokes a uh, memory but it is not home as we know it right it is home completely reimagined through the eyes of this incredible artist who has an unbelievable skill and a painstaking approach to be able to create this image and this is why I haven't spent enough time with it because every time you look at it, you notice something else. You notice a little billboard or you notice a little building or even a figure. And those are all real things that exist in New York, just recreated and reimagined in a new way. It's truly remarkable. I love it. I love, love, love that piece. I really want to see it in person, Rachel. We'll have to come out. <laughs> well, George, no one's in my house. Time. No one's in my house right now. So. <laughs> What's your address? Go on by. <laughs> I can see why you want to rush back for it. It's yeah. Like, yeah, he's very, very talented. And actually, I was just at yeah. Sydney Contemporary, and a few of his pieces were there too, in small scale. And I saw people stand close to it, and they're like, this is amazing. And I thought to myself, wait till you see it in three meters. It's really yeah. something. Oh, incredible. Did you find anything else at Sydney Contemporary that you fell in love with or? No, I was stood down. I fall in love with a lot of things, but actually thanks to George, George threw me some passes to the affordable art fair a week prior, mm. Mm. which actually I wasn't mm. planning on going to, but a friend was going and it was the only time I was going to see her. So I said, oh, I'll meet you there. We'll stroll through the aisles. And I bought four pieces that day, one yeah. from you guys. And then- yeah, true two very large pieces and one um, kind of small print edition. So I did my damage and I flew up to City <laughs> Contemporary two days before coming to Bali with the strict instructions of do not buy anything. More because like logistically, it would be really hard to figure out how to get everything where it needs to go. But City Contemporary was great. There was beautiful works on display, some incredible artists, you know, doing their work. But I behaved. Mm, very good. Do you know what's funny? Um, Jody walked past us after you'd brought your Eve Sellers. She goes, loop two. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, I see you. I, it's great you did the damage at the affordable art fair instead of Sydney Contemporary. The see? budgets are a bit different. So. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's also, um, that's why it's great to go to all of these things, right? And like art doesn't mm. have to be expensive. You know, I have some pieces that obviously are an investment. And then I have other pieces that I'm just as moved by that are, you know, one fifth or one tenth the price. And so art, art doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to talk to you and tell a story to you. And that's why I love finding art in all different places. Absolutely. Dare we ask, Rachel, do you have a favorite artwork in your collection? I'm going to tell you a story. When I got to Melbourne 15 years ago, I once popped into the Flinders Street Gallery while Dion Horseman was having a show and I loved his work. I was like, this is amazing. 
And it, like, it was nowhere near a price point of something that I could afford, nor did I even own a wall to put it on. Like this was just not something that was in my realm. But I remember saying to myself, I want to be able to buy this piece in the future. And that represents a few things. Like one, I want to be able to like have a permanent home where I can have a wall that this gets drilled into. It's like they're big, heavy steel pieces. So I want to be able to have a home. I want to be able to afford a piece like this. And I want to be able to buy things that move me. And I had kind of this like silent wish to myself, like I want to own one of these pieces. And Jody in her absolute beauty, remembered me saying that to her. And for my 40th birthday, she had this piece commissioned. She actually contacted Dion and said, my wife has always loved your work. He's like, I can make her a piece. And so Jody had shared that story with him and just kind of talked about me a little bit. And they came up with that piece together. And so that's really special. First of all, it's the first kind of work that we commissioned and it really represented a turning point in my life where it's like art is something that we are going to invest in. And I, I don't mean as an investment, I mean like this matters to us and therefore we're going to put our energy and our resources into it. So that piece was built for our new home. Now our new home uh, started to get built during COVID. So this means this piece was commissioned before the pandemic hit. So on my birthday, it was delivered April, 2020. We are totally locked down. And that's actually when we were about to start building the home. So this poor piece sat wrapped in a blanket for three years in a garage. But the beautiful part was we were able to design a wall for it. So I don't want to say that the entire house was designed around this piece, but like the entire house was designed around this piece. <laughs> and so the wall was picked. It was reinforced with like extra studs. So that wall was for that piece. And every rendering yeah. that we had of the house as it was being imagined by our architect, every rendering had that piece in that spot. And so that piece has become an anchor, not just of like this moment in time where I had always wanted to have a piece like this. And then all of a sudden I did, but literally our entire home was built around it. That's incredible. Yeah, it's really sweet. It must weigh a ton then. <laughs> like it's <Yeah>. very deceiving. <laughs> I, th I think it's 20 kilos, maybe. I think. Wow. Like, yeah. Really and what's amazing is that it's actually fixed to the wall at only three points. And Dion's a genius because the piece is amazing and you should see it like in different lights, it casts shadows. And so it's, the piece is amazing, but also it is geometrically balanced so that it basically has three pegs. So it sticks into the wall at three points. And then because I'm a nervous person, we just added three tiny little brackets to reinforce it. So think three pegs, three tiny little brackets, and it's able to hold this 20 kilo piece, fingers crossed, hold it in the wall. Um, <laughs> so that is because it has a mathematical and a physics component to it as well that adds to the genius of the work. It's incredible. You've done what? most of the art enthusiasts I know dream of doing, and that is expanding your wall space by like building an art home. What was it like? And I guess my other question there is, did collecting really inspire as you built and designed this thing? Because it clearly, you know, you've built part of it around this one special piece. Yeah. Well, that well, one of the briefs to the architect is we want lots of big blank walls because we like big, bold pieces. Mm -hmm. And the other part was we wanted to be really refined in the materials that we use because we wanted the art to do the talking. So our entire house is pretty much white, glass, concrete, and then like warm, neutral wood floors. We don't have any colors on the walls. There's no colored paint. We have one cheeky powder room that is wallpapered. That's like a black jungle scene. But other than that, every other wall is white. And that could be very boring unless you have really colorful art. So we still have a lot of wall space. Don't worry, George, blue thumb, <laughs> we're still coming at you. We still have, but, but it allowed us to do fun stuff. So going back to the Melbourne art fair last year, I went into, you know, one gallery space, Jack Willett, um, 13 something. I can't, I always forget what numbers his gallery is called, but he represents Johnny Nietzsche. And you can't be a Melbourne art collector without having a Johnny in your house. And he had these tiny ones, these small formats. And I loved it. And I was like, I'd love to have just a few of these small ones. Um, and he's like, oh, those are all sold. Like, I think everything Johnny Nietzsche's already sold. And then he said, but you know, this is crazy, but we just sent a piece to New Zealand. It arrived. 
and it like doesn't fit on the wall and it's like still in the crate. Do you want it? And I was like, turn that around. Um, so I went trying to buy the like, you know, the tiny bite sized piece. And instead I got the mega piece. But having these <laughs> walls allows me to jump at an opportunity like that. And that sits across a piece by an artist named Rowena, who I actually, I bought at the Affordable Art Fair two years ago. Johnny Nietzsche is this big, bright blue, like vortex. And Rowena's piece is these fluoro colors and crazy abstract patterns. And they sit across the entryways, these two huge walls. I would guess that they're 10 or 12 meters high and they can just talk to each other. And so that's another beautiful moment where again, one art is quite expensive. One art is significantly less so and in conversation, they're amazing. And then in between them on the bridge where you see the second story, I had a custom piece made for me, which is a neon light sign. And it says, don't be a drag, just be a queen, which of course is Lady Gaga from Born This Way. I love that. And so at, at night, if I turn that light on, it makes those two pieces glow in the dark. So it's very cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Gosh, what a house you must have, Rachel, honestly. <laughs> but I love the white wall idea because I think, yeah, I would struggle myself to think if I painted a wall of color, I'd then have to commit to whatever art is kind of going to go there. But what if I want to change my mind later on? Is the next art piece I want to put there? Is that going to work with my next painting, you know? So yeah. I totally get the white walls. And I was going to say, we also believe that art belongs everywhere. So like we have like a little home gym and that's where that incredible piece from San Francisco lives, that like huge piece. And we have a small Brad gun in that room too. So like, we're not afraid to put art in weird places. Like we've been recently talking about putting some art in our bathroom, you know, just like sure. every room deserves art. Yeah. I 100% agree, Rachel. I've got um, a print by Donovan Christie in our little bathroom that I love. It's uh, mm. it's of a caf cafe on our block and yeah, I love staring at it. And, mm. and yeah, my kitchen has art. Does, do you have art in your kitchen? Yeah, well, our kitchen dining is quite open. We used to have Bertina on the bench. She now has been moved to the side on her own table. And then it opens up into the dining area. We have the horsemen there. We have this incredible piece. Actually, I can't recall the artist, but it was an Archibald Prize finalist like 15 years ago. And I bought this piece. It's called Put Your Hands Up in the Air. And it's this also kind of like ugly flying angel. I don't know what it is, but it reminded me of my brother who died. And then around that corner, kind of going towards our bedroom is the Julie Gutman. So all of those pieces kind of play into the kitchen. And then we have some floating shelves over the sink and we have some small scale cause sculptures that represent the four members of our family. So yeah, we just like pop and then we have a, a metal sculpture that's like a cockatoo next to the sink. So, you know, we just try and put little pops of color because again, we have a really neutral palette, but we love color. So we use art to just pop color in little places. Can I ask you about this Julia Gutman work? I was doing a deep dive on her, so Archibald winner last year. This one's a fabric work. I just couldn't quite tell from your photograph it was a fabric, but I believe it is. so. It is yeah. fabric work. Yeah. yeah, 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 it's fantastic. I didn't know about her as an artist, but I had gone to the Archibald Prize in Sydney, like when it was on tour. She's, I think, the second youngest person to ever win it. She's a young woman. Not many women have won Archibald. So like she's a real person to watch. And the piece that won was kind of a wall hanging. And it was a collage that she made up of all different fabrics. She uses a lot of denim, like old jeans and fabrics. And she puts it together and then stitches on top of it. The work is really amazing. But I, I remember seeing like, oh, this won the Archibald. But I, I actually never knew her name. I didn't learn anything about her. And then I was at the Melbourne Art Show and I walked past and I felt very proud of myself. I was like, oh, that's the woman who won the Archibald Prize. You know, like, you know, art smug when you like know yeah. the artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Like, you're like that person into indie yeah. bands before. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. Before the EP came out. I had a demo. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I felt very art smug and I had never met. Joanna from Sullivan and Shrunk. Remember also that like I am unknown to galleries and I actually don't know a lot of galleries. I'm kind of this like weird stealthy person. I think maybe now as I'm a little more active and I just I said, hey, that person won the Archibald. And she said, yes, that's Julia Gutman. She said, we're going to have a solo show and her work is going to be projected onto the sales of the opera house during Vivid. 
And I just turned to her and I just said, I'll take it. She's like, what? I was like, <laughs> I'll take it. And so that was one of those instances where not only do I love her work, I loved how conflicted I was at looking at this one. Like, do I love it? Do I hate it? Do I love, hate it? Is it a friend of me? But also like she's a rising star. And for me, that just felt like a no brainer artist to have in my home and an incredible young woman in the beginning of her journey. So I don't like to have a financial lens or like a investor lens when I'm buying art, but mm. both sides of my brain fired on that one. And I was like, this is a no brainer purchase as well as a no brainer piece of art. Early stage collecting. Yeah. Yeah. And in 10 years, I'm going to be like, I have a Julia Goodman from 2024. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be super yeah. smug about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rachel, you're a trustee on the NGV board. I'd love to know sort of how that came about and what, what it actually entails. I'll tell you what it entails first and how it came about is a bit of a mystery, I think, to me sure. even. <laughs> so what it entails is I'm part of the team that's entrusted by both the government and the wonderful taxpayers of Victoria to be custodians of the governance of the gallery. And so it's our job to provide governance and oversight to ensure that the strategy is being enacted, to ensure that the executive team who are formidable have everything that they need and just look after this incredible crown jewel that we have uh, in Australia's cultural stable. And so I feel it's an unbelievable privilege. I think everyone knows the NGV punches so far above its weight on the global scale. We have a world-class team, we have world-class exhibitions. And I just pinch myself that I get to hang out in that room and learn about art as well as contribute to my community and having this be accessible to all Victorians and everyone who visits us from around the world. And I am so excited that you know we have the Fox, the NGVC, the contemporary building that will be gracing our arts precinct in a few years. Um, and that just means more space for art, more space for artists to be on display. We'll have an incredible opportunity for living Victorian artists to be represented in all of those spaces. And so, yeah, it's a great privilege and hats off to quite frankly, the entire team there because everything is because of them. And we're so lucky to have such a world-class team building such a world-class organization and institution in our city. How that came about was we have an incredible president, Janet Whiting, and I met her many years ago at a lunch. Once I found out she was involved in NGV, I just kind of art geeked out with her, told her how much I loved it. And our relationship evolved in many different ways. And there's a whole process that the government goes through to select who is the right trustee. I can hypothesize that some of the skills that I have around next gen interaction with spaces like art galleries, technologies both in the art world and in org like in the building I think that are really important and so I try and add that specific value to the trustees meeting so I don't know how I was picked I'm very glad that I did and I hope that I continue to be worthy of my spot there. Speaking of technology something that's super interesting to to me and also to our artists and collectors is what's happening in AI and art for context, we survey our buyers in depth every year about all sorts of stuff and our artists as well. And so we ran a survey to a thousand collectors and a thousand buyers just recently. And a couple of the questions we asked were around, what do you think about AI, generative AI and art? How do you feel about it? You know, and it was super interesting, the kind of variety of responses mm -hmm. and where I'm getting to is you just gave a talk at an NGV event about AI and art and yeah I'd love your sort of take on it where do you sit on the optimism pessimism scared excited sort of scale and what do you think about the future yeah I think AI is here to stay and it's here to stay in a massive way and it will fundamentally change every aspect of our lives and the creative sphere is included in that in the tech world when people are scared about their jobs I said AI is not going to replace you someone who knows how to use AI is going to replace you and so if I take that analogy forward to creativity I think that artists are going to more and more use AI as part of their process but maybe not as the tool that generates their art so Sam Leach who is a, a wonderful artist who joined me on that panel he specifically uses some AI as part of his 
uh, brainstorming process. So it, it's, it's a critic that he can wrestle with. He also used it to brainstorm or predict the, what is the type of image that I would likely produce. And then that actually held up an interesting mirror to him. And he's like, oh, am I a cliche? And so it became just like an input to his art. And then he has one piece specifically where he used AI quote to like detect if you're a polar bear, you know, he kind of was tongue in cheeking with it. So I think there will be some artists that play with AI as a concept in the same way as anytime there's a new technology and we as society are grappling with anything, artists find a way to reflect that back to us in their work. Mm. AI as a tool that make artists more effective and more efficient in their creative process, I think we're going to see more of. And so for example, in the Yang, Yang Liang, Liang piece, he is starting to use AI because he has hundreds of thousands of images. He's not generating images using AI, but he's using it to help him to just manage and organize all of these images. And he needs quantum computing to handle the weight of those files as well. So he's using technology to enable him to do what already is creatively designed and in his brain. It's like saying we want sculptors to make incredible things, but we're only going to give them toothpicks. It's like, no, we gave them, you know, chisel and hammers. And then we gave them tools to cut stone in big, broader strokes. And AI is giving our artists more tools to bring their creative genius to the surface in a less painstaking way. And so for that reason, I'm optimistic. I actually believe that the more AI is creating and generating content around us, the more we're going to crave our artists and the true, like unique creativity that they bring. So I think that we will see AI being used in art either as a subject matter, but more importantly, as tools. And I think that that's a good thing. And I don't think our artists will be replaced because we as humans are going to crave it more than ever. Yeah, I agree with that. When the f camera was invented, it kind of liberated artists to say, okay, I don't have to depict what I'm seeing exactly anymore. Mm. The camera can do it. I'm set free to do anything yeah. else. And so, you know, abstract impressionism, all that stuff. I'm no art historian, but the invention of this amazing thing that the device, the camera can take the exact photo, well, I can do other stuff and you're liberated. And I think yeah. maybe AI might do that for artists too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's certainly changing at a rapid rate and very interesting. And the funny thing you say about that artist on the panel who's already using it, well, a, a bunch of our artists said, yeah, I already use it. I already use it for mm. generative fill on Photoshop. Mm. I use it already to kind of help me set what I'm going to paint or what I'm going mm. to create. Or I just use it to fill out applications, you know, or like upload yeah, art. That, yeah, write a description, write a grant proposal, write an article for these art magazines, whatever it is. I think anytime we create these suite of tools, the power is not to replace what we do beautifully. The power is to replace the boring administrative burdensome stuff. So unlock us to do our highest and best work. And that's what I'm excited about. Like think about what artists could create, like how could they tap into their total zone of genius if we took all the, the burden off of them. And I see AI tools as systematically taking burden off of them. See, positive. Beautiful. Optimistic. Yeah, I like, I, yeah, I agree. And I think they probably relieve they don't have to do all the bad admin. Less. <laughs> but so less we've admin. Got, yeah. we've got more to go there though. <laughs> Rachel, music is another passion of yours. You spoke about wanting to play in a rock band before and start a record label. Does the music inspire or influence your work? Oh, the follies of youth. My best friend and I growing up started a band. We had a name, we had a logo, we had guitars, we didn't have any skills. So we never had a band actually. Music is just the other side of the same coin, which is sitting in people's zone of genius and feeling inspired and moved. I think I'm a very creative person, but I can't paint, I can't sculpt, I can't do anything. And so for me, I appreciate even more when someone can do that. Like that is so far beyond what my skill set can do. And the same thing with music, whether it's you know, writing beautiful lyrics, reading poetry or playing instruments. I can't do any of that. And so I just love it. I love seeing people's genius, especially in a space where I was like, whoa, I can't do that at all. I had done a podcast for the crew over um, at Rolling Stone and the Music Network. And I talked about the kind of analogous worlds of music and kind of record labels and like 
how it's a hits game and how you have to just place lots of bets. Um, and then one or two will become Beyonce. Uh, and that's pretty similar. <laughs> it's pretty similar in startup world. You know, like I place lots of investments with the belief and conviction that everyone is Beyonce, but we know statistically only a handful <laughs> will become. So even though I'm not in the music industry at all in any shape or form and cannot play three notes mm -hmm. in a harmonious scale, I see some analogies between the businesses. And this is a much safer version for me, Rachel, who lacks all of those skills in music to be able to play a similar game, but in a space that I understand extensively, which is business and technology. Yeah, my best friend and I, we had a band growing up too, actually. He works at Blue Thumb now, and yeah, unfortunately yeah. we don't play in the band anymore. <laughs> Well, you say that, anymore, at least think, you had an instrument to play. Well, that, that said, like, I do plan to try and write the intro to season two of the podcast. So watch this space. If you hear a wonky sounding tune when this comes mm. out. A George <laughs> Jingle, an tune. original George Jingle. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah, it could be, it could be. We'll see. Yeah. Well, um, see, then Blue Thumb yeah. will become the marketplace, not just for art, but jingles. And we'll know who's behind that product. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> well, that, that was the first idea for us was, you know, I wanted to do a music thing, but SoundCloud existed and was amazing. Yeah. So, you know, like, oh, art, art needs a SoundCloud. And so, yeah. <laughs> George, was, can I just kind of pay you some props? Because I remember when you started Blue Thumb, you were doing Smarty Mail. Is that right? Smarty mm, Mail? Mm. Um, yeah, and I met you, I met you at Startmate. It's like, a, it's a mm. decade ago now. Yep. And I remember you had this idea for Blue Thumb. And I think originally, was it like art for offices? Was it a slightly different? It was always sort of artists selling to collectors, but I think we were focusing a bit on trade back then. But yeah, it was, yeah. It was always about the marketplace model. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I remember and I was like, oh, I don't know about this thing. And I just want to congratulate <laughs> you and the team because you built an incredible business. I love being a customer of it. I love sending my friends to be customers of it, especially my friends who like walk through my house, they feel inspired by my art. They don't know how to start. I always point them to glue them. And like, this is not a paid placement, but I just want to, like as a startup investor, like hats off to you, you built something really awesome. And then as a customer, I absolutely love your product. So this is where investors sometimes get it wrong because I didn't see it at the beginning, but you really did it. It's a great company. Oh, thank you, Rachel. That's, that's lovely yeah. to hear. Last question from us is what is next for you guys obviously flying fox is just getting bigger and better and yeah what's coming up for you yeah i mean i i think what i love about my life is that i get to express the different parts of me so i have rachel the investor and flying fox is um, on an incredible journey and continues to go from strength to strength we've invested over 30 million dollars in close to 70 companies now we have a wonderful portfolio of great founders. So like, we just feel so lucky that I get to wake up every day and work with founders like yourself, George, who are waking up every day in their own beds, doing what they absolutely believe they're here to do. So what a privilege. And I get to be entrusted with hundreds of people's well hard earned money to hopefully make them a lot more and back incredible founders. So like, great. I'm so lucky that I get to express the part of me that, you know, craves and is fed by the creativity of others and art and culture. And I get to do that on a monthly basis with my time at the NGV, as well as buying art for my home or going to great art fairs. And, and it's very similar, right? Cause I'm not just buying a product. It's the same thing as a founder. When I invest in a company, I'm investing in that founder having some like unbelievable superpower and a downright stubborn conviction that they are going to build this thing. And when I buy art, that's the culmination of this artist, like everything that she or he represents as well. And then, you know, I have a, a wonderful home life. I have a partner who apparently resembles Burt Reynolds in the 1971 <laughs> Cosmo Centerfold. I have two wonderful kids. So yeah, those are just the, the three parts of my life that are really important. And I just feel lucky that I get to spend a lot of time and very authentically get to be in all three of those parts of me. So that's Fantastic. what's next. Just more, yeah. more of the good stuff. 
It's, Lovely. It's going well, more of it. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much Thanks, for chatting. Rachel. Yeah, and I look forward to uh, follow up inside the house with the full tour. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The art gallery. <laughs> Welcome anytime. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Guys. <laughs> thank you if you love art and hearing collector stories please share this episode with a friend don't forget to follow rate or review the episode to help make the pod more visible we acknowledge the aboriginal people and the torres Strait islander people as the traditional owners of the land we're recording on and we pay respect to the elders past present and emerging <laughs>